I want to talk to you about the uh, more, this is going to be the last lesson about this, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're actually given for the equipping of the early church, for spiritual growth, for service. When Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, he puts it this way. He says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service. So that the body of Christ may be built up. Some of those roles overlap like prophecy, or the prophets, and evangelists. A prophet is one who speaks the word of God, and an evangelist does the same thing. But an evangelist is actually more uh, specific, a uh, carrier of good news. He brings the good news. And so prophecy is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God gave the gifts of the Holy Spirit through laying on of the apostles' hands. It was to equip the church for works of service. Those are those gifts, that's, that's what those gifts were for. Works, the equipping for works of service. And we know that we can serve in a variety of ways. And by the way, we don't need the gifts of the Holy Spirit to serve. I'll explain that as we go through this. But they were needed initially in the early church. There's a variety of ways that we can, that we can serve. Have you ever experienced a bad hair day? That is a bad hair day. You go into a, I've gone into a barber shop and I tell them specifically how to cut my hair. And I came out one time and one side was much shorter than the other. And I, you know, they let you look at it. And I, I looked and well, yeah, so can I get home? And Debbie looks at it. And what in the world happened to you? Well, I had a bad hair day. Well, there was a boy having a bad hair day. He came to school. And he refused to take his hat off. Absolutely refused. I don't know if that was a stipulation at the school where you could not wear a hat. The teacher asked that boy in eighth grade to take his hat off. He refused, absolutely refused to do it. And he was willing to go to the principal's office. He was not going to take that hat off. He was defiant about it. Well, he gets to the principal's office. The principal could have, uh, I don't know what he could have done. Maybe he could have kicked him out of school for his defiance. But he decided to explore the situation, try to understand what was happening to the boy a little bit more. And he discovered that he had gone to the barber shop and the guy gave him a bad haircut. And he refused to take his hat off because if he did, then you know how it would be with an eighth grader? How they would make fun of you? And it'd be easy. I can understand that. Be a lot of uh, laughing and carrying on about the way. Well, so he refused to do that. He didn't want to be embarrassed. And so, what we find is that this principal said, Hey, if I cut your hair again, would you be willing to take the hat off and go back to class? And he said, Yes. Now, if I offered to cut your hair, how many of you would take me up on it? I hope no one would do that. No one. No one should trust me to cut anyone's hair. But somehow, it happened. Now, this attitude of this principle was this. He said, a great leader always recognizes that sometimes it's necessary to step outside of your comfort zone and daily routine to set others up for success. I don't know what the daily routine is or what principle is. Uh, is it to cut hair? I doubt it. But he was willing to do that. And he explained, now here's why the boy trusted him. He explained that he was on a college basketball team. And that many of the players came to him to get their hair cut. And he had been cutting his own son's hair for the last 17 years with professional clippers. And so if you're, I'll go home and get them and cut your hair. If you'll be willing to take your hat off and go back to class. Well, he did. He did that. And so... He was demonstrating patience, understanding, encouragement to him by explaining the situation, and he took advantage of it. That boy did. And so we have a skill, too. Now, like I've said, my skill is not to be cutting anyone's hair. But we all have this skill because we all have access to this. We all have access to the Bible. And we have the skill for living. Yeah, 
the skill for living. Now, whenever you look at the word wisdom, that actually means the skill for living. It comes from God. Now, here's a, here's a proverb I want you to remember. Proverbs 11, verse 30. A good person gives life to others. The wise person teaches others how to live. That's what wisdom is. Teaching others how to live. Well, I think a lot of people need to be taught how to live. We all have that skill. The more we open up the Bible, the more we study, the more we apply it to our lives, the greater that skill will be, and we can use it anywhere. In fact, Paul says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. God gave opportunities to do good by giving the gifts of the Holy Spirit to his people through the laying on of the apostles' hands. He was equipping them for service and guidance before the New Testament was complete. Now, if you were to go, let's just suppose that we're in Corinth and we're 2,000 years ago, and we're going to go to church. We're going to go to a worship assembly there. What would you find? Well, one thing you would find, you wouldn't go to a church building. There would be meeting in a house. And there were some wealthy people in the church at Corinth there. Uh, one, of the, one of those people may have opened up his home, and you would go in there, and at the front of it was called the atrium, right there. And that might be where they would have their meetings. They would meet in the atrium. And if you were to go in there, and you were to participate in the worship assembly, what was happening there at Corinth was that there seemed to be a lot of chaos. There were those who had been given these gifts, and one of them was the gift of tongues. And really what that means is that they were able to speak in a different language. Another language. But in speaking in a different language, there needed to be someone there to interpret. So one of the things that Paul said, they were doing that. You might have several people uh, speaking in tongues at the same time. There was not time for anyone to give an interpretation to understand what was happening. And so Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he says this. He says, everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. They weren't doing it. They were not doing things in, in a fitting and orderly way. And you look at this idea, there was the gift of prophecy that was given. Not, that doesn't mean foretelling the future. I mean, that could happen. But it's mainly the idea of speaking God's word. They were given that gift. Now remember, they didn't have access to the whole New Testament. It was just being written. It was just progressing. It wasn't complete until the end of the first century. And so you're there in, in 55 AD or, or something like that. And there would only be a handful of uh, books written like Galatians and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. That would be about it of the New Testament. And you might have access to the Old Testament. But it wasn't complete. And so you needed that gift of prophecy for someone to speak. And then there was someone else being given the gift of, of explaining well, what was just said. That doesn't necessarily mean what was said that the person knew and how to explain it. Someone else was given that gift. Well, someone was given the gift of speaking in tongues. And I wonder why. You know, I've often thought, why, why that gift? You speak in a different language and then someone else is to give the interpretation of that language there. And that's the only way that it was to be used. So here is one thing that stands out to me about why God gave that gift, gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gift of speaking in tongues. It could be this. Cooperation, unity, teamwork is what speaking in tongues should teach the church. They needed to be cooperating. They needed to be working together. There needed to be teamwork. There had to be some, if you were going to speak you know, in a different language, then there had to be someone there to give the interpretation. And so everyone had to be working together. And why? What was the end point of meeting together? But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. They were meeting to worship and listen to God's word from those with the gift of prophecy to strengthen, encourage, and comfort. That's what it was for. Now suppose that someone is speaking in, in tongues and, and there's several of them speaking. Are you going to get in strengthening, encouraging, and comfort? No, you're just going to be hearing a bunch of jabber. That's it. And so he says, when we look at this, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. 
But I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. Unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. The purpose of speaking in tongues is to edify, that is, build up, encourage. So the only way that speaking in tongues would be beneficial if someone was there to give the interpretation. Speaking in tongues was not gibberish or chatter. It was a language. Luke uses the word to describe what happened to the apostles on the day of Pentecost, the day the church began. Starting in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, we read, All of them, that is the apostles, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God bearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, the gloss of that's, the, that's language. Same word as before, earlier in the passage. Can you picture on the day of Pentecost groups of people kind of congregating together? Some of them are from Cappadocia, some from Parthia, some from Egypt. And you have different ones kind of, it would be natural, wouldn't it? That you would be with others that would speak the, the native tongue. Now they may all have been able to speak Hebrew or Aramaic. They came to Jerusalem to worship. I don't know if they all did or not. But you can imagine that the apostles going through that big crowd that day and coming up to a group and then they're able to speak. The Holy Spirit started to use them to speak that language to those people. And it made a difference on that day. And then we know that, that Peter got up and he spoke in Aramaic to everyone. That was the first gospel sermon. But Corinth was a cosmopolitan city. It was a great uh, city of commerce. There was all kind, people from all over the world really coming there who would speak different languages. But the universal language at that time seemed to be Greek. But Paul uses a passage from Isaiah to explain how God spoke through different languages. But it was Assyrian in this case, and it brought judgment to unbelieving Israel. In the law, it is written, With other tongues and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people. But even then, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So God was speaking through another language. And the foreigners, in this case the Assyrians, they understood their language. God would use other languages, that is, tongues, to speak to people who understood or understood with interpretation. Speaking in tongues was used with an interpreter. They were to work together to make the gift of tongues effective. And so tongues then are a sign for Believers. Tongues are a sign for not tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers, but for believers. When you look at this, and you see tongues then are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. If they couldn't understand the how could that be a sign for unbelievers? But not for believers. But in this case, the unbelievers would be those who are Christians. They became believers and then ended up being like unbelievers. And if it was used properly, tongues, an unbeliever would come to the assembly and there was interpretation, they could become a believer there. So it's kind of a confusing passage here. Hopefully, I won't make it clear. I can interpret it for you this morning. But Paul is talking about the worship assembly where every word 
was to be understood. And he writes, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Chapter 14, verse 19. And what then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, there's to be order. Everything is to be done fittingly and in order. Paul said to prophesy, speak from uh, God's message because it is understood and it strengthens, it builds up one's faith, encourages us to serve and comforts us over losses that we may experience. So if a whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and inquirers or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind out of your mind. Tongues without interpretation are for unbelievers. First, the Christians with this gift speak other languages, whether they understand what they are saying or not. To them, understanding doesn't matter. Some of them were given this gift, it was a real showy gift, and they didn't care if if someone interpreted it or not. And in fact, they weren't going to wait for someone else. There were several speaking at the same time. And in that sense, they were misusing this gift. And in a sense, they were becoming like unbelievers. They were not following the instructions that were given. Paul mentioned speaking these other languages at the same time. No one understands what is said. What's the result to visitors who come in? Well, they say you're out. Of your mind. You're out of your mind. But if an unbeliever or an inquirer, now this is someone who's visiting, he's an unbeliever, he's visiting, he's an he's inquiring, comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all. They are convicted of well, why? Because someone is speaking God's word. And they understand what is being said. And they can hit them in the heart. They can be convicted and they can repent. Because they understand. As the secrets of their, but you look, as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. This is a worship assembly where everyone understands. This also happened to unbelievers in the day of Pentecost when the apostles were using tongue speaking in an understanding evangelistic way, but not in a worship assembly as Paul is addressing here. Paul emphasizes that the worship must be done in an understanding way, no confusion. He stresses this with several analogies. And here's one of them. He says, now brothers and sisters, if I came to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you? Unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or a word of instruction. Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds such as the pipe or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? See, these people could all be speaking tongues at the same time. There's no distinction. There's nothing there. There's nothing to understand. There was no tune coming through. Or another one he gives, again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? The Romans would use this. The legions would use They would use a trumpet. They would have different calls for different formations, different battle, battles. And so in this section... Paul says, undoubtedly, let me back up. He says, so it is with you, unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. But you've got to have the meaning. You've got to know the meaning. If then... I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying. I am a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. 
Even so, you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. They should not be using the gift, like the gift of tongues, just to show off or build themselves up. That wasn't the purpose of it. They were to be using it, they were to, to learn to cooperate. They would speak. Someone would give the interpretation. Then everyone would understand. People could be built up. And so in the, all that was happening, there was cooperation. There was, ended up being building up edification. There was teamwork in all of this. If they didn't have the, that purpose in mind, they would be put in the category of unbelievers. If they just wanted to show off, they become an unbeliever, according to this passage. And remember that when they did this, the visitor would think, if it's just a bunch of people, and you've seen this before, you, you've heard of it in different churches, that, that supposedly speak in tongues, a bunch of people are saying things at the same time. They're not following Paul's instruction. Not at all. And some people would come and worship, visiting. They would think, boy, these people are just out of their mind. And that's what they would have thought 2,000 years ago. I think that's what many would think today. And so, for this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. So follow the way of love and eagerly to desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God, unless there's someone given interpretation. So, what if you came into a worship assembly at Corinth and you didn't understand a thing they were saying? You wouldn't be encouraged, you wouldn't be given any hope. There wouldn't be any comfort in that. It would be like, it was just a waste of time. Why did I go? Indeed, no one understands them. They, they utter mysteries by the Spirit. This is someone speaking in tongues, a different language. But what if you come and someone is giving a talk, but you don't understand it? What if you came and the message was about the resurrection of our bodies? But all we heard was jabber, chatter, gibberish, a language we didn't understand. Would we be enlightened and strengthened and encouraged? What would we miss? If we couldn't understand what Paul wrote about this topic for everyone to understand in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And what he wrote gives us a bright, uplifting future. He writes... But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? If our bodies die and dissolve into the earth, then how is it possible? And in what way can our bodies be revived and made alive coming back from death? Paul explains that resurrection means transformation of our perishable bodies. How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant a body that will be, but just seed. Perhaps of wheat or of something else. So when you sow, you do not plant the body that will be. It might be, he uses different uh, analogies, and he's using one right here. And it's a principle of the seed turning into a plant. The principle of transformation. And I know that we all think that tulip bulbs are the most beautiful thing out there, don't we? Tulip bulbs. But isn't it amazing what tulip bulbs end up becoming? I didn't know I had any sound. But you can see that they become a beautiful flower, don't they? And so, in the same way, when you think about our bodies, they're not going to be the same. It's going to be different. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. 
So flesh and blood we see perishable. We see the kingdom of God and imperishable in this. And so, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. And so one commentator says that God will give to us a glorified body suited to the new life in heaven. It will be as unlike our present body in quality as the glory of the sun is unlike a mushroom in the cellar. We will use this new body to serve and glorify God for all eternity. If we believe in the resurrection of the body, then we will use our bodies today to glorify God. But you can see imperishable, raised in glory, raised in power. It's going to be different. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in a flash and twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. So how long will this transformation take? But it will, all, it will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. That's pretty quick. It will happen. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When John writes about this place of immortality, that is heaven. He describes heaven in the following way. He said that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the whole order of things has passed away. He describes it in that way because everyone has experienced these things. We've experienced tears. We know of people. We will all die. We know of people of God, we mourn, we, we grieve over it, we cry over it, and the older you get, the more pain you have in your body. Can you imagine, and again, I'm using tulips here for this island, if someone could convince people that there's an island where the blessings of verse 4, in Revelation 21, verse 4, a place where there's no tears, no death, no pain, they would sell. They would sell everything they had to go to that place. Well, there is a place where all of this is true heaven, and yet strangely, most people remain indifferent about whether they go there or not. What about heaven? Do you imagine heaven as, a beautiful, as beautiful as the following pictures? Just look at these pictures. That's beautiful, isn't it? Do you imagine heaven as being that beautiful? Or like that? Or maybe as beautiful as this along a, a shore there. Or maybe you have a house and you have all that green lawn back behind you. Isn't that beautiful? Heaven would be far more beautiful than those places. Far more beautiful. Why would I say that? Because that's what the Apostle John is trying to do in picturing heaven. It's beyond our imagination. He, he puts it this way. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. The wall was jasper, the color of glory, and the city was pure gold, translucent as glass. The foundations of the city walls were garnished with every precious gem imaginable. He describes heaven as a place of great value, giving a picture that makes it priceless. And for us to grasp the magnitude of heaven is like I've used this before. This is a wonderful illustration. Like the natives in New Guinea. Before internet, before any kind of technology, they just live there in the jungle. And someone tries to, comes there, they've been to Alaska, they've seen people living in, the Eskimos living in igloos, and they try to describe it to them. Would that make any sense to them? I mean, they're trying to describe it to them, but it's hard to grasp. Or it might be some nomads in the deserts of Arabia. And the only thing they've known is that. They've never experienced what you find in Minnesota with lakes 
one lake after another beautiful lake. You can see the foliage changing in different colors. There's all foliage in the deserts of Arabia. But you're trying to describe it. Well, this is how difficult it is for John to try to describe heaven for us. Heaven is such a wonderful, beautiful place. He's just trying to show how priceless it is. And how beautiful and how wonderful it is. Just trying to help us to grasp that. So therefore... My dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I would want to understand that message. Suppose someone was going over that message. Now, they wouldn't have slides in the first century, but you're going in there to the church at Corinth and they're talking about the resurrection of the body and they're talking about heaven we're talking about the future that we have. And it's all speaking. Several people are speaking at the same time. And you don't understand a thing that they're saying. And maybe maybe some, someone is speaking in tongues. But there's no one to give an interpretation. So you don't understand it anyway. You wouldn't come away being enthused. Enlightened. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, and encouraging and comfort. Now, hopefully, when we come together, we've been strengthened, we've been encouraged, we've been comforted by the songs that we sing together, by being together, by partaking of the Lord's Supper. Remember the, the supreme sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for us, by taking those emblems, by praying together, by listening to the messages from God's Word that can help strengthen, comfort, and encourage us. Well, they were to serve with the gifts of the Holy Spirit that God gave them in those early days. Today we don't need those gifts because God has provided His complete revelation through His Word, His Holy Word, the Bible. By reading and applying it, it helps us to be equipped for every good work. Here's how Paul puts it in his last letter that he ever wrote. All scriptures inspired by God. And is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the person of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So God is always providing the equipping of his saints. Even before the New Testament was complete, he did that. But now he gives us his word. We have access to it. Let's don't take it for granted. Let's read it. Meditate on it. Even memorize some passages. Look at it. Apply it to your life. Put it into practice in your lives. And we'll all be blessed by doing that. Now, if you're here this morning, you've heard this lesson Jesus would say, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart. You'll find rest for yourselves, for a yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Well, if you haven't come to Jesus and met him in the waters of baptism, where he meets you as your master, your savior, and washes your sins away, well, you can do that this morning. Or whatever might be your need, once you come, as we stand, as we sing.